I had three major complaints with the Fuji X-T3 and with the X-T4, Fuji fixed all of them. This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the best way to make an amazing website. Now I'm here in New York and I have just a few hours to play with this camera and I want to shoot some side-by-side -side comparisons and show off most of these updates that are coming with this camera. So let's start out with IBIS. Even though Fuji said it wasn't previously possible, as soon as I turn on the camera, bam, the sensor is stable. And this allows a lot of the Fuji lenses that don't have stabilization, like the excellent 16 to 55, to go from looking like this handheld at over 80 mil full frame equivalent to this. That looks way better, but it doesn't stop there. We also have a boost mode for static shots. And on top of that, you, if you wanna push it further, we have digital stabilization as well with a 1.1 crop. Now I do have to mention that this was a pre-production camera and for walking shots, we are going from all this jitter to a nice smooth experience. It's not a gimbal replacer, but it gets us much closer to a gimbal than say a Sony. Enabling the electronic stabilization add-on does make it smoother, but just like other brands, you get that warp stabilizer jello effect. So I'd probably avoid it for walking and stick to the normal uh, IBIS mode without any sort of boost. I wanted to push this IBIS system to its limits, so this whole video is shot handheld. This is panning at over 90 millimeters, and here I'm walking over 90 millimeters, and even though it's not usable, it's still surprisingly good for a IBIS system with no lens IS. Even though I wouldn't recommend it, this electronic is making that walking at 90 much smoother. Even though I didn't have a lens that supported the full six and a half stops, it still worked extremely well on the wider angle of this lens and then on the long end, it worked great as well. And for the walking shots, I would say it is probably somewhere around average, but I need to test out some of those other lenses as well. People have been looking for the perfect vlogger slash YouTuber camera for a long time and there never has been a great one. Either it has bad autofocus or maybe no IBIS or the battery life is terrible or there's a huge crop in 4K. There's never been something that lined up just right. But with the X-T4, I think this is going to be it because we now have a flippy screen, great autofocus, great codecs, great image quality and finally battery life. Now the sensor in this camera is the same one as the X-T3, same with the processor. So in the modes where you previously had crops, say 4K60, it was a 1.18 crop, or for 1080-120, a 1.29 crop, that still exists just like we had before. And no, we do not have 6K recording. We're still limited to 4K, but one cool feature that was added is 1080p at 240 frames per second. Before we take a deep look at this new mode, let me give a shout out to our sponsor, Squarespace. I've been recommending Squarespace for over five years now because this is the best way to create a great looking website and one that works well. It doesn't matter if you're looking for a portfolio site, a blog, e-commerce, or anything else, Squarespace has got you covered with tons of great looking templates to choose from and they're cross-platform compatible, so they're gonna work on tablets and phones. Security certificates and SEO tools are included so that people will actually find your website online. Head to squarespace.com using the link below to start your free two week trial with no credit card required. And when you're ready, use the promo code MAXERIAP to save 10% off your first purchase of a domain or website. Now, just like the X-T3, when you're shooting in that high frame rate mode, you do not get any audio recording and it's already pre-slowed down. So unlike the Nikon and the Sonys, you can't record audio and decide uh, which chunk you wanna slow down or even keep it at that high of a frame rate. So that is a little bit of a downside, but on the plus side, like with the, all of the codec options, you're shooting at a bit rate that's twice as high at 120 FPS compared to Sony. And then at 240, it actually stays right there. So it's quality, it's you know fairly similar. Now I am gonna be doing some separate videos comparing the video quality, the low light in the IBIS to a couple Sony's and also the Nikon Z6, which I think this is competing with. So make sure you guys are subscribed so you guys see that. 
Now I have to be honest, I'm probably rarely going to use this 240 FPS mode for a couple of reasons. First off, as you could tell, we have quite a bit of aliasing in the image, especially when we have uh, regular lines. And the reason we're seeing this artifacting is because Fuji has to throw away even more data when we're pulling 240 frames per second compared to 120 or even 24. So in the side by side comparison, you guys could definitely see the difference in detail and also artifacting. On the plus side, Fuji has increased the autofocusing performance and it works even at 240 frames per second, whereas a lot of other companies don't even offer at 120 and some of them that do, it's just too slow to keep up where this one is keeping up at 240. There's also a trade-off in dynamic range, as you see here, our highlights are blown out and our shadows are crushed, but this isn't an issue with the camera. This is normal with other cameras as well to offer this 240 FPS with different cell phones. You have to lose something in order to gain all these extra frames, and personally, even though I'm usually going to be shooting at the 120 FPS for the better quality, I love it that Fuji is giving us this option, giving us the choice if we want those extra frames, and I wish every manufacturer did it because as of right now there are almost no cameras on the market that shoot at 240. Now one of my biggest complaints about the X-T3 and which made it kind of hard to use for me especially for weddings is the battery life. It lasted about 40-45 minutes depending on what settings you choose which this new one is going to give you at least double the battery life maybe even slightly better so that is a huge deal. Now that's not the only difference. The charger that's included in the box will actually give a 15 watts USB-C PD to the camera, which is a lot. That's double or triple compared to other brands. So you can be recording 4K and charging up a battery that's dead at the same time instead of losing battery life. And not only that, but it actually will accept up to a 45 watt charger to really give you quick charging. Now Fuji also has a new dual charger that you can buy separately that will charge two batteries in about uh, two, two and a half hours, which is awesome. Now we do have some downsides as well. I'm here shooting in a very loud environment and I wanted to listen to my audio to make sure that I'm not blowing anything out or if it's too quiet. And unfortunately, we no longer have a headphone jack built into the X-T3. They said that they simply don't have enough room with the IBIS system, larger battery. So they actually include a little dongle in the box, uh, just like you have for your iPhone or for your Samsung. So you have to keep that on you and then you can plug it into the USB Type-C port in order to monitor audio. And unfortunately, like often is the case with dongles, um, I just left it back at Fuji's meeting place. Now Fuji has also made some really good tweaks as far as the usability of video. We have a new little selector for photos or stills and it will actually save the settings that you have as far as shutter speed, ISOs, so you can flip back and forth and not have to go through and change all your settings which is really nice. And then on top of that, if you don't want to use the top dials when you're shooting video which makes it a little bit more difficult compared to stills, you can actually turn that off and then you could just use the touch screen or you could just use uh, the standard dials to change your ISO and your shutter speed. And now let's talk about pricing. The X-T4 comes in at $1,700, which is $200 more than the X-T3, which is still going to be sold. And for that $200, you get the in-body image stabilization, which is great for video. You also get battery life improvements more than double, which you really cannot understate that fact. Plus, we're getting the flippy screen, which is great for vloggers, for people shooting interviews, or just to close it and protect the screen. And on top of that, we're getting extra software options tweaks and different improvements. And don't forget that all of this is on top of the already great video specs of the X-T3. We have an excellent looking 4K image that is oversampled. We can record up to 60 frames per second in 4K and super slow motion for 1080. We have codec options of H.264 or HEVC with 10 bit up to 400 megabit per second. We have the great phase detection autofocus with face tracking and eye tracking and we have excellent picture profiles that a lot of people love plus a couple new ones which makes the X-T4 an all-around excellent camera. So I've said a lot of great things about the X-T4. What are the downsides or the limitations? Well, I think the biggest one is just the sensor. There's going to be people that want a full frame sensor, especially when you're looking at a $1,700 price tag. You're running up against the Z6, 
the a7 III. Um, so you have that sensor difference, but with that sensor difference, we also have 4K60, and now not only 1080, 120 like those have, but 240, so you have that advantage. And the IBIS, in my opinion, um, well, I'll have a comparison coming up soon, but uh, it looks better than those other options. And uh, Fujifilm rated it at up to six and a half stops, but at a minimum of five stops. And some of the six and a half stops are without lenses that have stabilization, so non-stabilized lenses. So um, other than that, I mean, I think it's a great camera. I love the X-T3 already. It had those three downsides that they fixed. They added other features and the price point isn't too grand. I think it's reasonable at $1,700. Now, would I have liked to have 6K recording? I don't know, maybe. Uh, it it kind of depends, but obviously they didn't put it in here. Uh, but I think what's more important is to have the usability features instead of higher resolution. Nobody really needs the higher resolution. This camera is already oversampling to achieve its 4K, which is one reason why it looks so good. So let me know your thoughts down in the comments section below. The pros, the cons, are you interested in this camera? And if you guys want to pre-order one, I do have a link down below. Make sure you guys enable notifications because I do have those comparisons with the Z6 and the a7 III and also the a6600 coming up as far as low light, IBIS, uh, and the image stabilization. This has been Max and I will see you in the next video.